So uh, in preparation for this message, I'm going to, I'll give you a little insight. We are going to do the next three weeks, we are going to dissect and go through the Sermon on the Mount. And what this stemmed from was we have here a school of ministry. Any school of ministry students? Yeah, we have a few. I see hands. Um, we also have it available online. So I encourage you, be a part of it. I don't know if you can join right now. You might have to wait. But do so when it comes available because it really is, um, it's, it's amazing what it's already producing in people's lives that they are, are giving that time to God and then seeing what it's doing in their lives where they're giving their mornings, Monday through Thursday, to just learn the word, to learn about God, and to grow. Um, but that's what this stems from. So somehow, I wasn't a great student, so somehow I got put on the list to be a teacher, and I'm like, mm, do we have to do tests? And they're like, well, you make tests. I'm like, mm, I don't feel qualified to make a test. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, based off of my, my history as a student. But they're like, well, what do you want to talk about? And I was like, Jesus, because that's the answer that you give when you're not really sure what you want to do. When you're at church, you say, Jesus, just ask your kids. They know God, Jesus. Um, so I said, Jesus. And they're like, perfect. And I was like, wait, I, mean, I didn't think that would work. Uh, so then I, I tried to bring it into a, an eight-week um, class. And so it's the life and ministry of Jesus, but we are focusing on, and when we go through the word tonight, you'll see, but we're focusing on Jesus' um, demeanor, how he answers things, how he conducts himself, how he uh, places things and works things and says things at the perfect divine time that it accomplishes what he was set out to do. Um, so the next three weeks, we're going to be going over that. Pastor Chano is going to take some. Um, of it also, and I, I truly believe that it's something that I've never read the word from that standpoint of looking at, okay, not just what Jesus said, but why did he say it, and how did he say it, who did he say it to, and what was his demeanor. So we're going to break that down. Um, I, I hope that there is some revelation there for you and just how he did things and why he did things. Obviously, we know Jesus didn't do anything on accident. And it wasn't just happenstance that something happened, that it was on purpose, and there was a reason for it. And just breaking down the word from that lens has been so eye-opening to me, because basically what it comes down to is Jesus, everything he did, he did it from a place of honor. Everything was from a place of honor. Now, respect is earned, but, or, or respect is earned, but honor is given. And we are honorable so we can be, or we honor so we can be honorable. And Jesus, from this whole standpoint, and as he, as he conducts himself from miracle to miracle to miracle, we are able to see that he comes from a place of honor. And I think if we could just align our, align our lives to operate from a place of honor, no matter what, the world would be a better place. That we would be in a better position moving forward to operate from that place of honor. So, Let's dive into the word. We're going to go to Matthew 5. We're going to start reading in Matthew 5 here. And we're just going to go verse by verse. We're going to read it out of the uh, ESV is what uh, I'm going to read this out of. So Matthew 5, we're going to start in verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and he sat down, and his disciples came to him. This is always the result of a miraculous, God-honored ministry. That's what, what the crowds coming around and people hearing about what Jesus had done and who he is and who people were saying that he was. All of these people started coming around because it's, this is always the result of a miraculous, God-honored ministry. So verse 2, we're going to read about the Beatitudes. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, I think what, let's start with this. Verse 1, in the B part of the verse, it says, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So when he started the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably the, the biggest sermon of Jesus' ministry, he started from a, a seated position, that he didn't walk in from a place of 
look at who I am, see who I am, I'm the authority here. But he came in humble, and he came in with honor, knowing who was coming around and who was going to be a part of this whole scene. So the Beatitudes, verse 2. And when he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So this is an idiom for the, uh, just a strong desire. It's a strong desire for righteousness. It's a strong desire to be right standing with God, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is a pure heart or a clean heart, and this happens at salvation. That your heart is as white as the driven snow. It's pure, that it's clean, and this happens at salvation. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he's coming in here and he's, he's, he's talking from a place. And again, he started where he was seated and people started to gather around. And he starts addressing what we would see if we were to look out, what we would see the low of the people coming, the low class of the people coming, the people who didn't demand attention, the people that weren't, hey, look at me, the people that didn't look like they were an authority or the people that came from wealth or, or the people that were royalty, that he, he breaks it down. And he said those, like, for instance, verse 5, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. He breaks it down and it's blessed are these people who, again, seemingly are, are down and out. Blessed are them, and then the blessing that they get. So verse 13, salt and light. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be, except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So salt is a seasoning and a preserving chemical. But if it's exposed to the sun, the rain, the air, it loses its flavor and it becomes worthless. So here he's talking about salt and losing its saltiness. And what are you supposed to do with it? You're, there's nothing good once it loses its saltiness. It's thrown out. But it says that we are the salt of the earth. Therefore, we cannot lose the saltiness. We cannot lose the taste we cannot lose that desire, so then we're able to make the impact that we're supposed to make. Verse fourteen: You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill, <clears throat> excuse me, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. As a believer, we become the light of the divine in the world and in the social system of man. Now, I take this as a charge for today in our society, where it is dark. It feels dark, it feels evil, it feels like there's absolute chaos, but darkness feels like it is prevailing, that we are supposed to be the light of the divine in the world, but also in the social systems of man, that we are the light, no matter where you go, that you are the light of the divine. Understand what's inside of you. Understand who has your back. Understand who your dad is and then start walking in that authority and then walking in that light. Walk into dark places because light always wins. Darkness cannot overtake light. That if we walk in knowing that with that authority, we're able then to be the light of the divine. Both in the world and in the social systems of man. Verse 15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The purpose of all good works is to glorify the Heavenly Father. 
That's the purpose of all the good works that we do. You can know what you know. You can have revelation. You can have, have the word inside of you. But if they're not works, how are people going to see it? How can you be an example? And then how is are there any glory given to God if there aren't works involved? We have to operate knowing that we are the light and we are not to be hidden. Verse 17, Christ came to fulfill the law. Verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So here it's, he didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill the law. I think, again, what's hard is we want to say, well, this is, he came to get rid of, of the law of Moses. No, no, he came to fulfill that law. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said of those of old, or to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell, to the hell of fire. We must have just and lawful causes to be angry. And then, even then, we have to keep our temper under strict control. We cannot let anger control us. For instance, I'm, I'm raising my kids, and I want them to have emotions. I want them to understand what emotions are and then how to deal with them. I want them to show emotion, and, and they can be upset or they can be angry or they, I want them to experience those emotions, but they always have to be in control of them. So I, with Trip, we had this conversation last night. We were outside playing football. He didn't do what he thought he was going to be able to do, and then he was down, he was mad, and he was angry. And I said, hey, you're allowed to be mad, but you are always in control of your emotions. You will always be in control of your temper. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. We operate in the fruit of the Spirit. You have to have self-control. So again, we are emotional beings, but we never lose control of our emotions. You're going to have those things. Let them understand what that feels like, use them for good, but always be under control. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So if you have anything against anybody, I mean, we talk about forgiveness here, and forgiveness is key. What's hard for us to differentiate is forgiveness and forgetting. I think that that's very difficult for us, and then it's we will hold this unforgiveness when in all reality it is only affecting you and not affecting anybody else. We have to forgive. Forgiveness is key. So if you have anything against somebody, forgive them. Be done with it. Move on. Is anybody here? It's really quiet. Am I just going? I'm, I'm going fast because there's a lot of verses. I understand that. Okay, verse 27. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. 
So this is with continual longing, with the mind made up to commit the act, if at all possible. It then becomes the state of the heart, and it is as deadly as the act itself. You have to be in control of your mind, of your heart, and of your emotions. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better to lose members than your whole body to go into hell. With this, it's we have to be so active and so vigilant to fight against sin. We have to, have to, have to fighting against sin. That if your right hand sins, cut it off because it's better to lose your hand than hell. Again, Jesus going through all of these things is not abolishing the law, but he's fulfilling the law as he explains it. Verse 31, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord that you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for, the, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no, and any more than this comes from evil. We can't make false promises. But what I take out of this, this section here is, let your yes be yes and your no be no. That your word has to mean something especially as Christians, as, as believers, our word has to mean something. So when you tell somebody you're going to do something, do it. If you tell someone you're not going to do something, don't do it. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. And again, in this scenario, Jesus is sitting around and, and multitudes are starting to gather. And he's taking the law and then explaining it. He's fulfilling it. He's, he's talking about the heart behind the law, not just the law. And then how we are supposed to live and how we are supposed to operate. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. So this verse here, I've, I've heard since I was a kid. We had a, a ministry training program here called the Second Mile. And it was when someone asked you to go one mile that you go the second mile and, and you do extra. A little breakdown for this is, is during this time, it was customary for royal couriers to forth, uh, force others into transport service. So if they were or taking a message or taking a letter or taking something, they would force people into being, the, the, the royal couriers would force people into transport service. And it was an unpardonable offense to refuse. So what he's saying here is that when someone comes up and a uh, royal courier, for the, in this instance, gives you something, tells you to take it a mile, to take it that mile, but then also take it again. He said, we are going to go above and beyond, that we are going to, to basically go so far that no one can accuse us of not doing our, our part, of not being who we're supposed to be, that you take that second mile and you show who you are. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. He sends out rain on the just and the unjust. 
For if you love those who if you love those who you love, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. So here he's using the reference tax collectors, and it's used 23 times. The term tax collectors is used 23 times, and they were despised by the Jews. The Jews hated them. They, they were not nice. They were not kind. They persecuted the Jews. So it is used as a reference of the lowest of lows. Any reference to being lower than this is uh, than this class or the tax collector was the greatest insult that they could have given. And he said, do not even the tax collectors do the same to love who you love or love who loves you. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than, or what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. This is complete in conformity with God's laws, that we are perfect in God's laws. So he's basically saying, if you were just to say, if you were to greet someone, greet your brother, greet someone that you know, everybody does that. But we are going to be kind to people. We are going to Say hello to everybody we see, whatever that may look like. But we are going to go above and beyond to make sure that's, that's what we want to be here at Guts Church, is we want to be a place that people can come and feel welcome no matter what their background is, no matter what their past is, no matter what they look like, no matter what they've done. We want them to come to a place. We have a meeting every Sunday morning and uh, with the staff before church, and I, I bring it up. It's we want to remove all anxiety and worry and hesitation so that people can park, check their kids in, get a coffee, come through the door, and have a moment with God. That that's why we're here. Because that's where they can find healing. That's where they can find breakthrough. That's where chains of addiction can be broken. Stuff that people have carried for decades and decades and decades can be broken in one moment, the suddenly of God. But that's why we are here. We're here to make sure that we are removing. That's why we have par, uh, parkers, a parking team. We want to remove the anxiety of where do I park? We're going to tell you where to park. Well, why are you telling me where to park? Because we want to remove the anxiety of you trying to find a spot. We want to make sure that we are here to help you through the process so that we can get you through those doors so that you can worship and praise the Heavenly Father, hear a word and have just a moment with God because that's where that breakthrough is. We are here to go that second mile. You assume that people are going to take it one mile, well, we're going to be the people that take it that second mile. You're going to assume that, that people are going to love people who love them. Well, we're going to love our enemies also. Because in all reality, they're sons of God also. God loves them just the same. That unconditional love. That's really hard for us to wrap our minds around. But we're going to love people. Why? Because all we want to do is get them to have a moment with God. We want to get them to a place where they can find that breakthrough and find that healing. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that your word is alive, that it is true, that it is yes and it is amen. Lord, I thank you that as we, we go through the word, Lord, I thank you that you bring revelation as we read the word. Lord, I thank you that, that it hits every person where they need to see it, where they need to hear it. Lord, I thank you the way that they need to hear it so that they can have that revelation and then that breakthrough in their life. Lord, I thank you for every person sitting in here. Lord, I call them blessed in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that even when it feels like we're down and out, Lord, I thank you that you are a champion. Lord, I thank you that we can stand firm knowing that no matter what, it all works together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Lord, I thank you that we can walk in the confidence knowing that everything we put our hand to prospers. Lord, I thank you that our bodies are healed in Jesus' name. 
Lord, I thank you that by your stripes we were healed. Lord, we received that healing promise. Lord, from the top of our head to the soles of our feet, our body is perfect, lacking nothing, nothing missing, and nothing broken. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you the opportunity tonight to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe you haven't done it. Tonight's the night. You fought it. Maybe tonight's the first night you've even thought about it. I want to give you that opportunity. Or if you say, you know what, I did it in the past and I have not lived a life and I need to rededicate it. I just need to make that declaration between you and God that you are rededicating your life. You're making Jesus the Lord of your life. I want you to put your hand up and put it back down real quick. I see you. God bless you. Is there anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. It's a great day. Your greatest life imaginable starts today. Because you walk with Jesus now. Is there anybody else? Okay, I'm going to have everybody repeat after me, but also, if you did raise your hand, we're going to have ministry people. I want you to come talk to somebody because, again, today is a great day. Everybody repeat after me. Father God, I give you my life. I make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. I think that I'm going to heaven, and I will never smell the sin of hell. I walk with Jesus now. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, I thank you that from here on out, You are a part of every area of my life. Even the ones that are hard to give, even the parts I don't want to give you access to. Lord, I thank you that you have your way in us. And Lord, I thank you that the future is bright. Lord, we love you. We worship you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand real quick. Thank you so much for tuning in to Guts Church YouTube channel. I'm Pastor Chano Trevino, the assistant pastor here at Guts Church. And on behalf of our leadership team, our staff, our church, it's our hope that this message met you right where you are. If it did, I bet there's someone you know who could use the encouragement of this message in their life. And you sharing it with them could make all the difference. The mission of Guts Church is to help people win. And you can be a part of that simply by sharing, or better yet, inviting someone to tune into Guts Church online with you every week. Take that next step to be a part of what God is doing right now in this moment in time by being committed to showing up, placing a premium on God's word, and receiving all that God has for you. You can share this message, gather your friends for services, make it a priority to make this the place you want to be. God has so much for you. I truly believe that. We love you. We're praying for you. Can't wait to see you soon.